I didn't read. Oh, got it. Okay. I, <clears throat> I didn't realize when I was um when I was learning classical music when I was a kid that <laughs> that you're supposed to play what's written because if I didn't like that part I would just make something up that I liked better. <laughs> And this didn't go over real big with my teacher, but luckily I had a very sympathetic harp teacher who Mary had the same teacher. Mary Radsman had the same teacher as I did. And uh, I would always show up at the lesson without practicing. And uh, she went, that's okay, honey. I saw, I saw Rosemary was here too. She, I think she had the same teacher. Several of us have been imprinted by Jean because she was just a lovely person. And um, because she never squelched my weirdness, you know. So anyway, this, this particular focus, because we just have an hour and it's a huge topic, is what do you do with students who, A, never, never can get off the page, like they have to have the music in front of them or they can't play at all, and what do you do with students who can't read music um, or don't want to read music? Um, and so these are tools that I'm going to give you a worksheet in a little bit. Um, but the whole, whole secret of it is never give them the worksheet. You teach them by ear, and this is what a lot of you don't do. Um, a couple of people have said to me, well, why don't you write a book on improvisation? I said, well, no, because then the, the, it'll just become a book of etudes. You know what I mean? If you're reading what I wrote, it's going to be my stuff. And the point of improvisation is you do your own thing. I mean, in some of the definitions, they say, that actually, that would be on your sheet, actually, says uh, to create and perform drama verse or, or, or music spontaneously or without preparation. And I don't think that's really true in music. You have to prepare a little bit, don't you? I mean, if you forget to, if you forget to, you know, stop at the store, you don't, you don't want to go out again. You're just going to improvise some dinner in your kitchen, right? Um, what if you order pizza? Is that improvisation? Heck yeah. <laughs> I think, I think it is, but a little less creative. That's more like, you know, taking a piece of music and playing something that you hadn't planned on. But I, I, I was teaching in, it was in, I can't remember where it was, it was Texas. It must have been Austin. It was Delane when she was still there. And it was her group of Suzuki students. They were teenage girls, all of them girls. Um, and I don't have children. <laughs> Moment of sympathy, please. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. And they were, they were wonderful, but they didn't quite get me, you know, and I didn't quite get them. And, and afterward, and it was a, like a five-day class, one of the Suzuki camps. And I, I snuck a look, they were on, the surveys were on top of Delane's desk, so I snuck a look, I know we're not supposed to do that, but I snuck a look, and the top one said, the improv teacher just seemed to be making it up as she went along. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, profound, my work here is done, they get it. But then I realized they had no idea what I was doing. And that's the thing, I mean, if you're Suzuki, if the focus is learning my ear, right? They don't, they're not paper trained, they learn the pieces by ear first, is that right? I'm not a Suzuki train, so I thought this would be a really good fit. But the thing is, they don't understand why would they want to improvise. They, it's, it's ear training, but it's scripted ear training, whereas improvisation is freedom. It's, it's a chance to give students uh, their own choices. You know, it's like you send them into the kitchen to make, to make a meal. You don't, you don't give them a recipe book. You just say, make me a sandwich. And with all the other kinds of music, even Suzuki, it's all scripted, it's all curated. So that's what got me excited about doing this more, more widespread. Um, and the other, the other um, comment that stuck with me was, there were too many Kim-type classes. <laughs> I was teaching quite a few other topics too. And so I mentioned that one too, because this isn't for everybody. So you're going to have students who are going to be so turned on by this, it'll, it'll rock their world, and other students who, it's, it's like, no, they don't get it. They want the recipe. They want they want the script. You know, so um, so I'm going to show you what I might do. Oh, do you have harps? I don't see anybody. I see a few of you with harps. Yeah. Well, I'll show you anyway. Yeah, if you want to pull up a harp. Hey, Margaret. Oh, it's nice to see so many people I I uh, used to see in person. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm gonna, I'm in the KSC right now. Um, the, the, the other reason to teach improvisation to your students off the page, you know, something that's, that's um, spontaneous, is um, it, it, it incorporates all the elements of music. So we have rhythm, we have technique, we have what else? Expression. What are some other elements of music? Beauty. I mean, this is the thing. When, when students are playing off of the, you know, they're learning a piece, uh, written page, they tend to sound awkward at first, you know, sometimes for years, <laughs> right? So, so this is a chance to make beauty right away. When my niece was little, she, uh, 
She didn't actually know how to read yet, but so she'd take a book, sometimes upside down, and tell, these, tell us these cool stories. Once upon a time there was a dog, and he decided he wanted to fly, and she would just go on and on with these wonderful stories, and then she finally, you know, I, I didn't see her that often, but next time I saw her, she was maybe five, she had learned how to read, and I said, do you want to read a story? She was, yeah, the book was the right way up, and she was, once upon a time, there was a little boy, and his name was Nicholas. And it's like she was sounding out the words, and like all the magic was gone. She was reading somebody else's recipe, and I thought, oh, that's too bad. I mean, you know, why do we take that away? It's not that. I mean, I know they need to read, learn to read, but what about? Shouldn't kids be doing like poetry slams and stuff when they're two? You know, <laughs> I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. So yeah. So the point is, it's creative that they're doing something that's not. So there's no right or wrong to it, and maybe that's the one takeaway if, uh, if I'm babbling too much today and you're dozing off. It, there's no right or wrong. In improvisation, there's no mistake. It's only another choice. And, um, and this is the other reason I like teaching this. It gives people more confidence in their performing. That, I mean, if you... I guess I give a whole workshop, workshop on parachutes or, or uh, safety nets. So it's not exactly that, but by learning some of these left-hand patterns, right-hand patterns, cord vamps, and this kind of thing, it gives you some place to go, whether you, whether you freak out and can't remember the song or whether you need to make some fill between the bride coming down the aisle and, and they weren't ready yet. And so it's, it, it gives you this confidence that you can live in the moment without, without you know, stalling, playing getting stuck in the middle of the Pacaville Canon uh, chords, you know, which is, so if you had that happen, right, it's like, oh, you know, how can you make a big entrance with your, on, on, the, on the four chords? So, so this is a, a test of kind of, I, I like to call it surfing the now, where you're teaching these students really to listen to what they're doing. So we're going to start with them. Those of you with harps, I won't spend too much time in this because I'll just give you the workshop, worksheet, but I want you to experience it without having the sheet because the minute they look at it, it's, it's that, and that's where their attention is. Um, if they're beginner students, I'll probably just start them with a fifth chord. Um, this and so you're not, so let's take a, an A, E, A, A, and A minor chord. So I'll do it in my right hand so you can see. My, my strings are blurry, apparently. I'm, I think I had the cat, the cat ear for, uh, uh, sound. Y'all got it? So that's going to be the first chord. And the second one, we're going to raise the thumb up to C, which is a tenth, right? You got that, everybody? So I'm going to go four beats on each. So listen to me play and then join me. I'm going one, two, three, four. Two, so try that. Three. So it's already quite beautiful, and I'm not even playing, I'm just in one hand. And then um, there's a whole sequence of right hand patterns that they can do with that, or not. I mean, sometimes because I think, especially for the beginner students, they have trouble getting their two hands together. So I might just have them. Two, three, two, and four. Try glissando. Two, three. Yeah, I did uh, my last. Uh, my last seminar I was teaching, there's a little little girl in the class, and so I did the glissandas, which we all know how to do glissandas, but we did the bunny ear glissandas, which finally captured her attention. And the three-eared bunny. And the lop-eared bunny. Didn't know how to do the lop-eared bunny, so those three three bunny ears, and put the middle one away, and then tilt your hands so you can almost get like a feeling of an octave. Two, three. Kind of cool, isn't it? It's not kind of cool. It's definitely cool. All right. So, but this is the other thing. You're making choices that you like. So, do you like that? Maybe not. You know, too many Kim type chords. So, you find your chords, the ones that, that suit you. So, so the next um, one I usually introduce. I mean, they're really simple, and the the point is when they're really just starting out, the hard part is getting two hands together. So this is one I use a lot in Celtic music. I'm taking a GDG, GDG. And my F is still natural. And I'm gonna drop just the fourth finger to F. So that's, uh, for those of you who are counting, it's the mixolydian mode. So try that. I'm gonna do this in a four, four time as well. Two, three, four. Drop the fourth finger to G, uh, to L. Two, got it? Three, four, three, two, three, four. 
Sounds Celtic, doesn't it? You could, you know. For those of you who have harps, just just a, just a try it, and it doesn't have to be fingered or a special special fingering or pre-planned. But just do this chord pattern back and forth, and try it. Try playing some stuff on your right hand. And one thing I, I object to, and some other teachers have had a little clash on this, I don't like the word noodling. The, the people say, well, you just noodle around. And I, I personally don't like that term, because noodling has no what? No, no punchline, I don't know, no purpose, no, no direction. It sounds like aimless, like, you know, I'm not going to noodle. as good as I am at noodling. <laughs> it's just boring, but if I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to evoke a Celtic vibe, beautiful waves crashing on a rocky beach in Brittany. I'm actually doing less notes. Look at my fingering. It's appalling, right? <laughs> So that's the whole point. This is not the time you start teaching them cross under and, and, and all that stuff. This is the time to just let the student be free. Um, now, a lot of them are going to have trouble even doing this. So what you can do is alternate hands. So maybe some of you are having trouble doing it, but alternate hands, left hand. Like a call and response kind of thing. And it doesn't just have to be slow, it can also be peppy. I'll show you a couple of those. You're all dying for the worksheet, aren't you? Uh, so then <laughs> the other ones on here is just pretty standard, like at the heart and soul, which it's really useful. It's a really useful chord pattern. Many of you yeah, piano students, you learn that, but you can add a tenth to it. So try that. I'm going CGE. AEC. FCA. GDB. It's, it's amazing that that's the, the tedious thing I had to play when I was taking piano lessons with my sister. It's just beautiful and it makes a great interlude, like if you, you know, you're changing t songs, you want to change, change keys, whatever. It's a, you know, anyway, um, and then you can do the minor version of it too. You could also reach up to the 11th. One, two, three, four, eight, nine, ten, eleven, then resolve it on the 10th. So I'm going C, G, F, E. Everybody got that? C, G, F, E. A, E, D, C, F, C, um, B, A, C, B. I just was thinking to myself, could any of my beginning students do that? Probably not. But uh, if you have students, I'm sure a lot of you have more advanced students than I do because uh, I teach mostly Celtic music. So. Would I use this in a Celtic song? Absolutely, in an air, it'd be lovely. So, and, and again, the things don't need to be slow and misty swirly, it's just a good place to start with them. Um, yeah, I had this little boy in one of my, he was, I was teaching at the Irish Best School of Music, and he's, like when his brother, when it was his brother's turn, this kid would like run laps around the room that we were teaching, and like he's that high part, you know. And I finally captured his attention with a, with a rhythmic pattern, and, uh, and he learned all by himself Brian Baru's harp, you know, the classic. Uh, and um, apparently, uh, later on, he played it for his whole, his whole school in, in the gymnasium. Like, not just his class, the whole school. And suddenly he had all this street cred. I thought that was so cute. Like, harp is still cool, yay. And he was adorable, too. But it, was, it, was just, but it had to be rhythmic. He doesn't want to play something pretty like that. You know, he had to be. We, and then the other thing we taught was the mute in the end. So take that, I'm taking AE, and I'm stopping the sound. You all know how to do that, right? So now you can improvise to that, and that's the thing. You're incorporating rhythm with uh, an unjudged melody is something that you just chime with it, and it creates two-hand coordination without the, without the panic, I'm not playing the right notes. So what if you do play the wrong notes? Cool. That means it's something different. So I'm going to do this on a, let's do about six, one, two, three, two, two. And with your right hand, just simple. Move to F. You can move your left hand around. 
but I'm playing just simple chords. Um, so a really great bluegrass group once had a festival who changed. They had a persona where they all came out in different costumes with different names, and, and the bass player all in black came out and played a, a song called In a Bad Mood. And I, you know, he got out there and looked like a... probably get a grant if you do that on harp if you do something edgy like that plus it's just fun uh, I think one, one big challenge on our instrument is making it not sound pretty all the time because you know we like our pretty notes and our long sustain but by having a little more recklessness in your playing even if it's just as improvisational exercise it uh it creates more energy, even if you're never going to play. That was not that was pretty awful, right? But then, if I'm going to play an actual chord chord progression, I'm going to use that energy. So I'm still letting it ring. But. improving <laughs> and see how you can kind of you can work stuff out on these instruments so I'm going to just do one more thing on this sheet and then I'll give it I'll have um darn I'll send it to you well the other exercises on here um, there's little, some smaller patterns that work really well in small harp because I have a lot of you know lab harp students and then um then there's a bunch of right hand patterns which are you know uh, in Scotland they they call them twiddly bits <laughs> because they, they, you know, they sound, uh, and we, we use them in, and we all use them, those tremolo kind of vibe. Um, my students were, were doing them. Um, it's a great thing to do in a harp ensemble. Some of them were doing the, the um, tremolo up here. I don't know what the song was, but we called them icicles because it was at Christmas time and uh, or they can be fairy dust, or they can be smaller ones. And then some of the patterns that are on here are actually moving patterns. My favorite that I use in my own arrangement is with the sixth. So let's see what's this starting on. So from the bottom, my third finger is on a C, my thumb is on an A. Got it? And I'm going to go down, repeating those notes, the same pattern. My strings are so blurry. So, and then I can speed that up. So, what did I just play there? Whenever I do this for students, they go, What's the chords? They want to know, they want the whole deal. You know, they want the whole sandwich. So, I was playing, I was playing the heart and soul. You know, this one. I was doing that minor key, so let's try that. So it'd be A minor, F, D, D minor, E. So sounds totally different, doesn't it? And here with the sixth pattern, so start with your thumb on C or third on E. good <laughs> it sounds pretty right it doesn't sound I mean I, I didn't know I was gonna play that was t just uh, using those two elements but if you're playing it musically and bringing out the right notes and that's step three right if they're beginners you have to teach them what notes should I bring out usually you don't want to bring out the repeated note because that'll be it'll be tedious you know if you're going you want to bring out the, the note that would be typically more melodic Okay, so, uh, and then there's also triplet patterns and, uh, and um, in large patterns, but they're all in this worksheet. And then the next step that I might do if I have a student learning a Celtic piece, and these, at this particular, in this particular format, teaching Irish music, you're not supposed to give them the music. They're not supposed to have it, but they're big babies and they want it. <laughs> I'm terrible. I mean, it took me years to learn how to memorize, so I shouldn't be judgy, but... Uh, but, you know, I'm the teacher, so I'm allowed to a little bit. But um, we're allowed to put the music on the floor. That's, the, that's my compromise. <laughs> yeah, but no music stands. The problem with music stands, they block you, don't they? Even if you're using one of those iPad things. Um, 
But then I've had long arguments with classical musicians who say, there's no way I can memorize all my repertoire because so many notes. And I get that, which is why I don't play classical music. <laughs> yeah, I like to listen to it. Yeah. All right, so, um, so if somebody's learning, uh, what's that student? She's learning this uh, rights of man hornpipe, you know that? So it's, it's all based on triplet patterns. It's not one of these you can play scattered hand like I usually do. So, so I worked out a little exercise. Putting the, the emphasis on different notes in the, in the triplet. she feels more confident when it comes time for the piece because she's done the groundwork. It's usually when people are playing this kind of stuff and they see those 16th notes, what happens? It's like panic, right? It's like, danger, danger. And then they, they speed up or they, they freak out. But if you have that pattern in your hand, so that's what I was talking about with this uh, definition of improvisation. You do prepare. You, you know, I mean, me and my little niece, she was making up a story, but she had enough life experience to know what a dog and a dragon was, you know. Uh, she wasn't, yeah. And then when you get older, uh, as far as being a musician, you, yeah, 16th no scare people know. It, yeah, it's a funny thing, isn't it? It's something about that extra little flag. It's like, I feel that way when I go over bridges. <laughs> I don't know, a little family vertigo. Everybody in my family has a bit of vertigo. But the other um, definition that I like much better is improvisation is to Produce or make something from whatever is available. From make something from whatever is available. Isn't that brilliant? So, if you don't have that technique available, you know you're your new harpist. It doesn't matter. You're going to use what's available. If you don't want to go to the store, it's okay. You can substitute something in your in your meal, or order the pizza, which is I think still a form of improvisation. Okay, and then the next step, the last thing on this sheet, and then we can actually um, hand it out and then talk about some more general stuff, is um. The pentatonic scale, which I think a lot of you are already teaching your students that, because it's such, such a, a nice, uh, a nice what do you call it, just add water improvisation tool. And you all know what I mean by that, right? So, so you, you take away the pentatonic, is a five note scale, omitting the fourth and the seventh degree of the scale. Uh, so, so we don't play the F. That's the fourth, and we don't play the seventh. So it sounds like this. So that's the basis of probably half the folk music, you know. Yeah, tons of folk music is based on that. Um, but then I made the mistake once of teaching them in G, and then they, they really love that because you don't use what? The colored strings, yeah. Do have you all got sucked into that too? So never teach them G first, because they'll never go back to. Yeah, pentatonics follows the um, the key signature. So I would try to teach them every key signature. It's also a way to sneak in some theory. This whole improvisation thing, isn't it? <laughs> not, that's not my forte, but but then you know you can uh, written on the sheet is a, a little triplet exercise in C, not in not in G. <laughs> That's the same thing in minor key, um, just riffing, riffing down the scale. The thing with the word improvisation, it scares people. So if you say, make something up, they're going to feel a little bit also insecure. If you say, play one of these five notes, like that they can do. You see, you're giving, you're actually lessening the choices, so it makes them feel more free. Um, and some people can't even, that's all already too much, so say, play, play three notes in the pentatonic scale. So they can, you know, here's my A minor. And it's still quite beautiful, and you can use these as exercises, warm-ups. Uh, but all this time, they haven't looked at 
a sheet of music. Um, and if you want to get really into it, then you can even actually work uh, the actual chords of the song that they're going to be learning, you know, the written music, whatever arrangement that you're going to be working on. Uh, so you're going to learn Shabig Shamar, um, which is one of, the, one of the standard O'Carolan pieces. It's kind of complicated chords. It's a... <laughs> Lots of jumping around, and that's hard for some people. So you just go through and play, play the chords. Yeah, I know the chords. Okay, please hold the applause. <laughs> yeah, I haven't ever tried that with that one, but I, I actually have an intro that I use that. It just outlines the chords, and it can also become a, a, a nice little interlude or a nice little, what do you call that, um, variation even? Yeah, and then the last thing on the sheet is my favorite thing in the world is my um, musical sandwiches, which are two-hand arpeggios, which um, we can try that. I think most of you have tried that with me if you've taken the class, which you have one note stationary, and the other hand is making the sandwich bread. So here's, try this on your harps, left hand is on CC. C, C, and right hand's on a D, E, G, and then he's going to go down. So maybe some of you haven't done this with me, suppose G, E, G, G, E, D. So you play it in the order of the notes. So first is the C. You got it. Now the left hand, the bread, see it's like bread with the bacon, lettuce, and tomato in the middle. The, the left hand's going to start moving now. This hand's not going to change. It becomes your, your drone. dynamics, I had a direction, um, and that just takes time, but you can do that with any chord, you can do it. Yeah, so, I mean, I have whole, whole pages of this of the exercise of this kind of thing, and it's the same thing, somebody said, write it down, I went, oh, no, because then it's not fun, <laughs> you see, so you have to, you have to frame it, you know your students, so maybe they need a theme, like, you give them give them an assignment, like, like, I don't know what age group you all teach, but it can't just be random noodling, because then it's not fun. You have to have a, a purpose. It could be you're writing a song for someone, or you're writing inspired by something around, around not writing a song, excuse me, uh, an improv, improvising a mood or whatever. Um, you're feeling sad, you're feeling happy, uh, you miss your dog, <laughs> whatever it is, you know, uh, just just play it out, and it's like that, that that expression, dance it out. Why don't musicians do that, you know? Um, and then the other fun thing with my childhood, and I'm talking a lot about my past, but uh, I had a bunch of cousins and we all, a couple of us were actual musicians and some of them just were, you know, good sports. And we cre created this band called The Cousins, the original, huh? <laughs> and, uh, and then we, because you know, grown-ups are boring, so, they would just be going blah, 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 blah. So we'd make up, we'd get a performance ready and insist, and then put something together and insist that they listen to our performance. And we didn't, not everybody had instruments, so we had like a, like a waste baskets and things from the kitchen. And, and the thing that mystified everybody was this thing called the mouse box, which was essentially a cigar box that had all these little toy mice in it. They looked like real mice. And, a, and I would shake them and it made a really cool sound. And, and then when I finally learned guitar, I had I passed on the mouse box to my younger cousin. That was like big honor, you know. <laughs> and so one of the adults mine said, "Why is it called a mouse box?" And so she goes over and opens it and she screamed. <laughs> they weren't real mice; they were little cute stuff. You know what I mean? You probably have seen them. Like they look like miniatures. Okay, they're a little creepy. <laughs> anyway, the point was we didn't. We we just made stuff up. We we created music. We that was the thing. And now I see. Even at my own family, like they're all taking selfies of themselves and making them. They have editing on their phones now, and they're doing. I mean, they're a little more self-conscious now, and it's it's not quite so. I don't know. That's just me being 
being a grumpy old person, but you know what I'm saying though. It's like, so if you have students who have a creative streak, this is great for them. And if you have students who don't have a creative streak, this is great for them. So I'm gonna pause now and uh, Dr. Darhan, you can send this out if you see it. Do you see it still? Yeah, she's gonna send it. And this is just one of the worksheets I use. It's just little, little elements. I would never give this to the student, I mean, unless it's a, a, a workshop that they're gonna have an hour and a half to work on it. And, uh, but even then, I usually don't give it out right away. And That's don't. Funny. I have a question with the, you know, when you're trying to work with musicality and they're improvising, um, how do you work with them in, in bringing certain phrasing out? Is it, do you take what they're doing and then try some different things so they can hear what you're doing? Or do you, how, how do you try to convey that aspect? Well, it kind of should come from them, right? Yeah. If it's not what you're saying, I guess what you're hinting at is it doesn't sound very musical. And it usually right. means they, yeah, it usually means they need to slow down. And that's the, the step one is get these chord vamps uh, under their belt, just the rhythm. You don't start adding a bunch of a bunch of right hand stuff. And that's and a lot of times I see advanced students say, okay, we're gonna play green sleeves and, and have an imp improvised interlude in the middle, which sounds easy, right? We all know green sleeves, so um <laughs> that <laughs> you know they, they, they get all crazy noodly so uh, whatever the improv thing whatever setting is should reflect the piece if I was playing an improv for green sleeves something's calm something just you know set it apart um, contrasting using some of the elements you can even use pieces of the of the rhythm of the song but if they're just improvising like random what do you call it um, abstract stuff is that what you're talking about Kimberly uh, I would suggest like get a storyline going if they're if they're that kind of person. What's happening? What, what's the story you're telling? Um, what's what's this song all about? It doesn't have to be literal. It doesn't have to be. Or what are you feeling when you play this? Or what are you seeing? It's uh, usually like I say, we're visual, audit auditory, or kinetic. So one time I went. I was trying to get a, a promo um, on my concert I was giving in my town and. It's hard to get press, you know, any, especially that was just a few years ago. Now it's probably impossible. Um, but I mean, in an actual newspaper. <laughs> and the guy said, he was, he was nice. He goes, Well, what's your story? I said, What? He goes, Well, what's the story? What, what, what is, because anybody, there's, every weekend there's 10 concerts, so 10 people giving concerts. Why are you giving this concert? What does it mean to you? What's the point of this concert? What's the purpose? What's the, like, he, he didn't use all those words, what he was saying is, what, you know, what's this all about? And he said, people won't be interested if you, unless there's a story to it. And so he was right. And then I noticed, and I'm just by hazard, I noticed that the concerts I did that were benefits for the, for the Audubon Society or ones that, that I was emotionally invested. Sure enough, more people would come to those, you know? So it's like, so you have to have, I guess, not necessarily an emotional involvement, but you can't just tell the kid improvise so you're working on your two hand coordination they're gonna you're gonna lose them in two seconds right instead uh let's see if you can create the feeling of a thunderstorm or you know or the feeling of i mean if they're little they love that stuff if they're older then have it be something poignant because then they'll pay more attention or or the opposite you know i'm tired of politics let's hear it <laughs> you know let's 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 wail on it so does that help i don't know it's it's i'd have to see the student but you don't want to show them how to have dynamics. You want to teach them how to come up with their own, I guess. And what if they play it totally static? Isn't that kind of what new music is all about? They play it kind of the Stephen Wright kind of stuff. You know, so it doesn't necessarily have to be the way you play it. You have to take all your judgment away as a teacher. I think that's the hard part. But, but again, I'm, I'm talking big talk here, but I don't really teach this one-on-one. -on -one. I teach this in workshops. And only, only a few people I know has it really... Um, affected what they do. One person I saw her years later, a Canadian that I know, and she was, she had taken this uh, idea of the musical sandwiches, which is pretty abstract and pretty weird and doesn't appeal to everybody. And, and uh, when I saw her several years later, she had done the most beautiful things with it, creating these whole landscapes of stuff. It was, I was so inspired that, that you know, something so 
so tiny that I showed her turned into something beautiful. It was, I taught her. Thank you, Kim. I just Yep. wanted to let everyone know I attached your handout in the chat. And if people have questions for you or questions about your handout, if they would type them into the chat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I see a bunch of chats there. Is there anything that needs addressing? Um, I don't think so. The chat's been pretty quiet. So I just wanted to encourage people to use the chat if they have questions. Okay. Because we have a Oh, lot I know of, they're we all have, just... oh, yeah, we have over 70 people in attendance. So we can't just I know open they're... it up for talking. Yeah. They, people use the chat just to say hi to each other. I know how that goes. <laughs> but that's part of the why we do this. It's it's lonely out there, isn't it? It's nice. It's nice having this community of heart players just pop up. One of these pop-up workshops, kind of fun. Uh, so, um, yeah, I was going to pause now actually to see, are there any questions or questions or concerns? <laughs> I mean, is this viable for any student? Probably not. Um, but I, if you want I think to... it's just some great ideas because I know I've, I've been working a little bit more with this with some of my students and, and it's that balance of, you know, we want to read, but we want them to also just become comfortable with the instrument. And when they're so concerned about trying to find, figure out what the note is on the page, especially the earlier students, and then finding the string and then playing it the right way. Having something that just, um, you know, brings in, as you were talking about that freer element, because I think if they don't, for, if they're not, well, I could like, I'm sure there will be people who disagree with me, but I think if they take two minutes and they're not thinking about their hand position, but they're getting to know their instrument and they're just expressing themselves a little bit that it, it is all going to merge together. It's, it will come together for them at, at some point, but this just, you know, it helps me to give as far as more ideas that I can work with. So I appreciate But you, that. but you, but you have to be, you have to turn off your judgment and not yell at them because their thumb is too low and all that stuff. Exactly. You know, this is this is a time when you let the the technique go, and and that you work on the So velocity. maybe, Yeah. whether you use it as a warm up in the beginning or maybe a little bit of dessert at the end of uh, Well, the time yeah, together, that, you know, yeah. Well, it it can depends be on this fun. on your student. You know, for myself, I use it for definitely for warm ups because I'm never going to play the grossy etudes again in my life. I think I'm actually. <laughs> I still do the I still do the Salzado ones, but uh, and I was not a Salzado student, but I think they're really strengthening. But uh, yeah, I mean, what a way to to stomp on your creativity, starting out with it, these etudes, da, 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 up and down linear. But if I can sit down and play kind of similar, you know, if I want to use my fourth finger. Oh, that was another thing. It's, it's really great to work on inversions with this stuff. Yeah, that's part of the in Celtic music. It's really important to work on your inversions because you don't you don't want to have always the root and the bass note. And a lot of people have smaller harps and they need to learn to adapt that. So, yeah. So you you have to figure out what you're teaching these people and what for. I mean, I mean, I was a bit of a monster that I was making it my own stuff if I didn't like the middle part of a Chopin etude. It's like, no, that's too hard. I'm gonna play it this way. And the teacher's like, um, you know, I, luckily I came from a small town where. They needed the money, so they didn't fire me. <laughs> So, That's Kim, okay. we have a couple of great questions that popped up in the chat. The first one says, is there a way to use improv in an ensemble? And the second is, in general, how do you go about teaching students to be comfortable in playing fast or faster? Oh, well, that's another topic. But as far as um, ensemble improv, yeah, it's really fun, actually. I mean, Obviously, I'm not coming from a jazz perspective where they, where it's actually scripted and they do the trading fours and all that fun stuff. Uh, you've all heard that, right? Where they, they do call and response. It's awesome. Um, as a harpist, I don't usually do that, but you can do, uh, you can create depending on the students. But uh, have one one group or two, or you know, even it's just three of them. Um, play the chords, the other one take turns to improvise, so it's like a round robin kind of thing. And there's something really freeing about that because remember there's no mistakes when you're improvising, it's only uh, another choice. So what if you make it sound really terrible? My my general rule is just go up one note or down one note, it'll fix it. So it's, it's also a really good way to rehearse, to practice for emergencies if you do make mistakes in a, in a scripted piece where you're, I mean I, I screwed up the wedding march one time, uh, the standard wedding march. And um, no, it was worse. It was a, I broke a string. Uh, I mean, I screwed things up all the time, but uh, 
but this the string uh, the string broke so what do you do that the climax you know da, 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 da. Thought, okay quick <laughs> I did something random but I did it with energy and uh, the, the dream tipped me so that was a relief yeah so I think uh, improvisation in a group can be really fun. You can have one group or just play the rhythm. You can have you know one group. Of course, we're talking about that that this stuff doesn't have to be pretty. And arpeggiated chords it can also be rhythmic. So this is group one, group two, second verse. You can pretend to echo each other, which is kind of fun too. And, and so then you suddenly switch, and then and it's it's like a kaleidoscope. Like you keep shifting it and. Remember, this isn't written out, so they don't know what they're going to do. Um, have you ever done one of those storytelling round robins where somebody starts a story and the next person takes over the next line and like that? That's kind of what it's like, except with music. Um, I mean, I know some of your students really need to learn repertoire, so it's not like you have time for this. But it could be a separate thing. It could be a Saturday improv day or... And can somebody think of a better word than improvisation? As I said, I really don't like the word noodling, but improvisation scares people, doesn't it? A creative, I don't know, has a stupid word too. I've never been able to brand this in a, in a good way, but I think it's important. Uh, I met this German harp teacher who said, why are you teaching beginners improvisation? It's the crowning achievement of musicianship. You should, they should wait until they're more advanced and, and technically adept. And I said, wrong. <laughs> I, <laughs> so this is the perfect time to teach them. Perfect time. because I, I call them using alternative notes, Kim rather nice. than improvisation. Let's try some alternative notes or alternative chords. I use that also. Oh, somebody put the word exploration. That's like, yeah, I used to use that term and somebody said, what do you do? What's your job? I said, I'm a sound explorer. Like I explore sound. Um, now I realize that was a little pretentious, <laughs> but I still <laughs> used to say it all the time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I guess we don't really need to brand it. We just need to play beautifully. So this is a, this is a, this is confession. Um, I, I'm not pr proud of this, but I have not been practicing lately for various reasons, and none of them really valid. I just don't, haven't been practicing, and I've been played like my last three gigs just winging it, where I sit down and just play, including some rather, you know, things I really should have at least had a set list for. So I'm talking. I don't even have a set list. And so I did this at the, uh, was any, uh, Rich, you were there at the Ohio Harp Gathering. I think I startled you the worst, so, but I didn't have a set list. I played the first night, which I thought would be fun. I asked if I could play the first night, but it, it's a six hour drive and it's exhausting. And, you know, I had no time to practice. Anyway, I get up there, I had no idea I was gonna play. So I played this and that. I found out the person I was driving with had a beautiful voice. So I had her up and sing a hymn with me. And then I met this really cool flutist. Um, she was friends with another, another I, didn't, I didn't hear her play, she, her, her mom, was a harpist and gave her a little harp during the pandemic. So she, she was basically a harpist to a uh, flutist who just learning the harp. But then they gave me these amazing homemade cookies. And I'm like, oh, they're probably the best cookies I've ever had. And so at the end of my concert, I was just fading. I was supposed to have a duet. I had a duet planned, but it didn't work out. And um, so I invited, I said, do you know how, I saw she was in the front row of the flutist. I said, you don't happen to have a flute with you? She goes, yes, I do. And she pulls it out and said, come on up. And so without rehearsing, she, uh, since we just we came up with a couple of Carolyn tunes and played them. And it wasn't great. It wasn't flawless, but it was fun. And um, and I figured she would be good because those cookies were so good. Yeah. And also, <laughs> right? And also, if somebody didn't have that kind of confidence, they wouldn't have come up, right? And also the person she was friends with was like one of the top flutists in the Baroque scene. So I figure, not just friends, I mean, they worked together. So I figured she'd have to be a certain caliber. But is that unprofessional? I mean, Rich, did you want your money back when you saw that? <laughs> I mean, it was kind of, yeah. You, afterward, you came out to me and said, well, you were really taking a risk, weren't you? <laughs> you really, I went, yeah, exactly. And then the next day, it was the, the improv class. And I'm, one of the students said, I want, I want to do that. Like that, that inspired her. That's what she wanted. She wanted to be that reckless and that confident. And um, I guess I wouldn't do that if it wasn't an in-house crowd. If it was a, a formal concert where people were paying $65 a ticket, I probably wouldn't do that. But that's why I started playing smaller and smaller venues because that was one of the most fun nights I had in ages. And I forgot all of my personal problems. It was just so fun. It was, and, uh, 
And then she gave me more cookies. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so that was that's my true confession. Don't tell anybody. Don't I want I don't want to see on the harp list. Kim never practices anymore. Kim's a has been. Yeah, so so, so Kim, have. Kim, we've had uh, about three questions about playing faster or teaching oh. your students how to play faster. Can you address that for us? Am I really the best teacher to teach that? I don't know. <laughs> so how to play faster? What's the hurry, Gail? Gang, what's the hurry? Why do they need to play faster? I just want them to play it in time. That's my, my quest, that they can play in, in on the beat. Everybody's in a hurry. Everybody wants to play jigs and reels. And, you know, I went to the Edinburgh Harp Festival last year, and oh my, having these people can play fast. They can play fast as fiddles, you know? And I don't know, I'm just not there anymore. Ask somebody else. <laughs> I mean, really, I'm not in a hurry anymore. And if it, if it sounds, if it doesn't sound good at the tempo it is, it's probably because their tempo is uneven. You see what I mean? And then that's the beauty of improvisation. You can play something slower tempo and, and then put some little fast twiddly bit in there, which is actually easy, easier on your hand. Well, I should mention one thing for the twiddly bits, the, the descending arpeggios. I've learned this from watching Perry Wayne harp players. You can lower your thumb a little and it'll help their speed. So I know that's bad technique, but you know. So instead of, instead of uh, I'm trying to pull in, that doesn't work instead. I'm doing the egregious thing of sitting side saddle. Uh. So if you have your thumb a little lower, let me remember to showed that hornpipe she was learning. Or the six I was doing. Look where my thumb is. It's atrocious, right? <laughs> so instead, if it was classical, but you don't want it articulated, so that's the difference. Some of these improv patterns are not the melody, they're just a little fill, you know. And now sometimes I do wacky, wacky things. And one time, Robin uh, Gordon Cartier was in the front row of my concert, and I was doing this weird thing where I slide over and then slide down. It was kind of unorthodox, but it worked for me, and my hand's a little bit odd. And um, Robin was sitting in the front row, and she, also she goes like that, and I went, oh no, I'm in Fort now, because all her teenage students were there, and, she, and then she goes, because I did it again, you know, <laughs> so then she knew it wasn't an accident, and so after the concert, it was, Miss Kim, uh-oh, uh she goes, yeah, she goes, do you know that thing you were doing, the doodle -doo 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 -doo? <laughs> yeah, she goes, can you show me how to do that, I want to show my students how to do that, and I was like, Whoosh. so she she saw the creativity and the, and, the, and the potential that some of this stuff, especially if it's not classical music, be creative, do something wacky, you know. It's like the minister of the uh, ministry of silly walks, you know. So I'd like to start the ministry of silly harp fingerings. That'd be fun. All right, so I think we're almost out of time. Uh, did I miss any questions that were besides about playing faster? <laughs> Am I being rude? Is, 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 why are people in a hurry to play faster? Is, is it you, the teacher, want them to play faster, or the student want to play faster? I think often it's the student. Um, certainly, I can best. say with, with my students, whether it's been piano students, voice students, harp students, they all want to play fast, as if playing fast is somehow a badge of uh, progress. Yeah, it's the same in the Celtic yeah. world. They play these, yeah. these. Yeah. The thing is, it's much harder. It takes much more musicianship to play slowly, doesn't it? That's when you're, it's like you're, you're naked, you know, showing your true, your true expressiveness and the musicality. If you're playing fast, you're covering, you're kind of hiding behind all those notes. And as a harpist, I don't think it's a good fit because our instrument is meant to resonate. And if you're going twiddly, twiddly, twiddly um, all the time, it becomes kind of relentless. But that's me. I've mellowed out. I used to feel differently. It takes so much, yeah, the slow air takes so much concentration for sure. Yeah, and, and there's so much beauty in the space between the notes. So, but that's just me. I just tell your students um, there's plenty of time. And also it probably means that they don't play the piece well enough to play it slow. You know what I mean? I mean, if you play a really slow piece beautifully, it, you'll, you'll you have a crowd in the palm of your hand. I, I think I've told this story before. It was a, a Celtic festival, Celtic roots or something. And there's really fast, like one of those boy bands with all the guys thrashing on their instruments. And I always go, get a girlfriend. And that's kind of how I feel about that stuff. Because there's, and, uh, and it's the fastest they could go. And afterward, this old, old, older woman um, and her 
guitar partner came out and said, oh my God, they gotta follow that. And she kind of takes her time, comes out and she's heavy set and sits down the chair, gets out her fiddle, takes her time and, uh, and proceeds to play uh, the Slock at Light, you know that piece by, um, by uh, John Anderson? Yeah, it's kind of stately, simple, but it has this one accidental in it and the guitar player like did a slide on it. it was, and within the second time through, the whole audience was wrapped. I mean, so she came back, her, her defense against the twiddly bit the frantic boys was to, to slow down and, and to hit them with music. And after what I came up to her, I said, how did you know to do that? That was genius. Kind of like Rich coming up to me that you took a chance. And I, was, I said, I was going, wow, that was genius. And she says, well, sometimes you just got to come out and rip your heart out and throw it on the stage. You know, just offer it. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So a couple just... more, sorry, a couple more questions in the chat. Don't know if you can see them. No, I don't see them anymore. Um, okay, I will read them aloud then for everyone. Um, one says FWIW, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, Taksim is the Middle Eastern tradition of improv. That's the first comment. Eastern. Not familiar with that. Yeah. And the second is, what do you say to your students if they are improvising and they get all embarrassed because they think they have made a mistake? Well, the, in a, in a mistake in the improvisation? I don't know. Most I, of my I, students... that, that's my question. I've got some students that are really self-conscious. Uh, and when they, when, you know, we, we work on improvisation and I, I laugh and I tell them, you know, you cannot make a mistake. And, but, but they have, they perceive how they want to improvise in their mind and it doesn't come out like what they have planned and then they're embarrassed because they think that they did bad and then they're little you know they're young kids oh, okay. and i don't want them to feel like they did bad because they can't do bad but what what can you say to a kid that's so sensitive like that well you could say sometimes you just got to rip your heart out and leave it on the stage <laughs> i guess they're a little young for that right let's see what can you say to a little one uh, I guess you need to you need to reframe it, and they're they're making it be about them, and they're stuck in their head, and so you got to find something that inspires them. I don't know if they have pets or or are they, how old are they? Um, they're actually they're they're just getting ready to be teenagers, so they're in oh that lord, age. okay, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the rough one because you can make them cry so easily. <laughs> I know, I know, and I have to be so yeah. careful. Yeah. That's a tough one. I guess I try to reframe it so that it's something that they're emotionally invested in, but it's not them. Because you've said the, th the three words uh, in their mind or what they expected. I mean, already they're not improvising. No. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I like that book, the um, the Secret Garden. Remember that book where the where they remember that book? I can't remember who wrote it. Where it's this big estate, but then there's this, it's a lock. I don't know how she gets the key, but she, she goes in as a whole bramble. It's, it's, all, it's not all the English straight garden, you know, proper English. It's instead, it's a, a just old, an old apple tree and it's just a ramble of wildflowers. And, but it's, it's secret. Nobody knows it's there. So she goes in there. I can't remember what happens in the story, but I think that's what improvisation is to me. Like if you're playing a, a piece, right, that's that's the English gardens with the tulips or the whatever, and then you have a key and you go into this place where you can escape that and you can, you know, you don't have to pull the weeds. <laughs> so you embrace the weeds. So I don't, I don't know. That's why I don't teach teenagers. That's why I don't have children. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, because they're difficult. And but I don't know. I just have to find, you just have to just find something that excites them or or moves them or I don't know they're making it about them which is kind of the teenage years right yeah sorry I need to leave oh, okay so I think you've got it as some appearances coming up there's some festivals that you're going to be presenting and performing at I know you're going to be at Somerset and the Irish festival and um and school in Milwaukee right that's right, yeah, and, and playing one set at the festival. Great, um, and then so you've got something with Sunita coming up as well, correct? Oh, that's in the fall, yeah, we do a, a harp retreat. We don't do it necessarily every year, so uh, we've skipped, we skipped a year, uh, so th this year, yeah, we're doing it again. Yeah, Where it's, uh, 
it's in West Bend, Wisconsin. It's this really great, great retreat center. It's kind of rustic, but they had me at Elevator. <laughs> I went to I went to scout it because I, I don't I live like an hour from there. And I mean, it's like this great, yeah, they have Elevator, all three floors, and then it's real beautiful grounds and hiking. It has a, a labyrinth and a little teepee chapel, and and they have a wine and beer license. <laughs> and so it's, and each room has a bathroom. So, you know, I've tried a couple different places for retreats and, you know, you reach an age where you kind of don't want to be that far from a bathroom anymore. So yeah, it was, it's been fun. And now Sunita, I know her father passed away this year, so I don't know if she's going to want to keep coming, but her mom still lives in Minnesota. So we'll see. So maybe we'll move it somewhere else. We did one in, um, in Port Townsend, Washington once. That was fun too. Yeah. But Sunita's hard to catch her. She's like, crazy busy yeah and can you tell us a little bit about the um lullaby book that you're going to be oh, yeah that I, that I started three years ago it's not done yet but uh yeah I started it um it's originally going to be for lap harp and I decided just to make it more general so I think I'm going to call it lovely little lullabies and I'm almost done and then I hurt my I pulled a muscle in my in a in my hip and like even sitting like this is about as long as I can sit right now so and uh and it happened standing at the computer trying to work on this thing i was twisting my back so be careful of repetitive motions and uh don't get out of shape that's what happened to me it was a cold spell and i had been on a trip and i just stopped exercising so it all catches up with you you know and I'm st that was a couple months ago and i'm still using a cane you know so it's, ugh, i'm in i'm in physical therapy now and all that so but it does people are really nice to me though it's been <laughs> kind of nice i did the ohio harp gathering people brought me dinner and it was really nice so but it's not much fun so i know a lot of you've been there and uh harp you know it does take your whole body doesn't it yeah even though we're sitting but uh anyway i'm almost done i got like five left i think so and some of them are well known and some of them are less are more obscure so we'll see i'll get back to you i'll have my people call your people and it's all harp solo or there is there any yeah. Harp solo. Oh, oh, harp solo. Great. Hey, Berlin, did we finish it yet? <laughs> <laughs> did, you had an injury too, right? Because that you said you couldn't sit at the computer too. We have some parallel wires. It's weird. Yeah. I crashed on an electric bike at Lake Tahoe and uh, fractured my knee. So that was a year ago, though. I'm pretty much healed up now. So. Did it heal? Yeah. Yeah. But I tried to convince people at, uh, at the harp gathering that I had got injured um, doing a uh, to hang gliding, landing, landing. <laughs> and nobody believed me. And then, and they just laughed. And then after the concert, this young lad, he was probably with his parents. I don't know he wasn't a harpist, but he goes, I believed you. I went, what? Because you look like the kind of person who would try hang gliding. I went, why, thank you. <laughs> like that made my night. <laughs> but Berlin really does that stuff. She's out there on electric bikes, on mountainous trails. Not me. But I yeah. shouldn't. <laughs> I realized uh, that I should not have done that. So I'm never yeah. on an electric bike again, especially on a bumpy trail around the lake. So, yeah. yeah I know. And we think that we're still 30, don't we? It's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, anything else, Kimberly? You look really comfy. You moved to a comfy chair. I, I did because I had to plug in my computer. It was about to die on me. So oh, okay. you know, this, is, this has been so wonderful. Thank you so, so much for, for doing this with us. And Mary, thank you for organizing this and Melodies for sponsoring this time together. Um, we've got a couple more dates that are on the calendar. So um, July 11th and August 8th will be our next two meeting, upcoming meeting times, again at three o'clock central time. So we hope we'll see you uh at those and uh, just watch your emails for more details about those presentations coming up. But Kim, and thank you so much. I hope you feel better too. Thanks. <laughs> you guys, I put a quick coupon up on our website, folkharp.com. I think just about everything that is Kim Robertson's on the website, if you use the coupon code Kim, you should get 15% off. I, I think I included everything in that coupon and I hope it works. I did it real quick. So, because <laughs> I'm you. still the web mistress. Even Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary, for doing that. Thank you. Thanks. That's not Kimberly Rosa, though. No. Yeah.
or Kim Ro or Kimberly Rowe. None of that. None of those other Kims. That's right. Anyway, thank you so much, uh, Melody's Music, for making this webinar possible. And thank you, Kim, for uh, giving up your time today to do this webinar for us. Uh, I know we all enjoyed it. I certainly did. Um, and I think some of us got a lot out of it. And uh, hopefully we'll all do more uh, improvisation and a little, be a little bit uh, less glued to the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you have any questions, you know, something specific that's not about playing faster, feel free to contact me. <laughs> Very Thanks, good. Everybody. I'll go ahead and, and sign off now. Thank you, everybody. You'll, Thank you'll you. I'll get a follow up up to you tonight.